All right. Hi, everyone. Happy Monday. We are the good doctors of Abbey Research. I'm Dr. Hinson. I'm Dr. Donnelly. And you're very welcome to our Monday webinar talking about using creativity in employee engagement. So we're going to go away now on the videos. As soon as I can make the camera disappear, yep. <laughs> as soon as we can get the tech to work, uh, we wanted you to see our faces and hear uh, because you'll be hearing our disembodied voices for the rest of the webinar. All right. Um, so we like to do this at the beginning of each webinar. It's kind of a check-in to make sure um, Dr. Donnelly and I are both teachers. So you always get students that walk into the wrong classroom and like you start, you know, welcome to intro to gender studies. And they're like, oh crap, I read the room wrong. Not in the right place. So this is the uh, room check part of the webinar. You're in the right place if you want to make sure that you're leading well. So certainly um, if you're in charge of uh, dealing with employee engagement programs, you're in a position of leadership. So you're in the right place if you wanna make sure that you're leading your people well. Uh, you know your employee engagement program needs work. So that's another big part of what we're talking about today is how we can help uh, improve your employee engagement program. Hey, e, is it recording? Yeah. Okay, because it's not recording on mine, sorry. No, it says it's recording. Technical issue. Um, you're in the right place if you've had retention issues because of employee engagement. We're gonna talk about this a bit more in a minute, but certainly those two things can be connected uh, and one can lead into the other. So you might not be sure if your employee engagement program is working well for you, but maybe you're having some issues with uh, retention and turnover, which uh, will certainly uh, you know, be a cause uh, or a result of some employee disengagement. Right, so as we waved high at the beginning, here is a little bit more of who we are to remind you. I'm Dr. Donnelly, and I'm the one speaking, and I'm the one in this picture with long hair. And I'm Dr. Hinson, and I'm the one speaking right now, and I'm the one with the curly short brown hair. Yeah, and we generally look like that still. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> that was a particularly great headshot day, so my hair definitely looks different today. But Yeah, my hair is not that great today, but that's beside the point. <laughs> yes but we, we work with what we have. So we um, have been colleagues, friends, uh, partners for uh, a while. We met in 2011 when we were both living in Belfast, Northern Ireland, working on postgraduate degrees in social science at the Queen's University of Belfast, which looks like Hogwarts, but is not that impressive. <laughs> a very prestigious looking building. <laughs> yeah, we had a great experience uh, getting our degrees. We learned a ton, um, but most importantly, uh, we, two most important things, we met each other and we became doctors. So between the two of us, we have about 30 years of both research and business experience on, uh, and in nonprofits as well, everything from ownership level uh, down to, you know, part-time worker uh, and everything in between. Making what our social science degrees have trained us to do is analyze people and cultures and organizations really quickly. And actually, uh, my PhD examiners were slightly disturbed at how quickly I was able to analyze <laughs> all, <laughs> all the organizations that I, uh, that I worked in and studied. Um, and we've been, yeah, uh, lots and lots of experience working around the world as well. So what we decided to do when we finished our PhDs was leave the academy. Uh, it, it, it has enough people and take yeah. the um, incredible skills that we were privileged to learn and we wanted to bring it back to the marketplace because we were in we were in business for a long time both of us and we knew that there are a lot of people out there selling things um, that sound like what we do but they're not actually really trained in it um, it's things like active listening and employee engagement and things as such and so we thought maybe we could uh, you know, help a bit. And so that's what we've been doing for the past couple of years. And that's the entire purpose of Abbey Research. How can we take our skills that we've been privileged to learn and how can we serve you and yours? So today, what are we going to do to learn in that webinar? Let's get down to the very brass tacks of what's going on. So in this webinar, we're going to discuss the, the challenges of employee engagement. Our guess is that you'll be nodding along to a lot of these. As we talk about them, they're the things that we hear the most from our clients uh, and that we hear the most from our friends who are also in leadership. We're going to talk to you about the importance of asking curious questions. This is one of the cornerstones of our particular practice that in order to engage employees or any other human being, if we're completely honest, you need to be skilled at asking curious questions. So we're gonna be talking about that. 
part of asking curious questions is listening better and actively. We'll cover that. We're going to talk about the use of creativity to improve your programs. We are aware that the word creativity, people, when people hear it, they usually conjure up um, an art class from their elementary school days that they or, may or may not have enjoyed. Yeah, like graphic designers or people in your office that might be considered creatives. Um, but we're certainly going to talk about some more practical ways uh, that you can improve your programs through creativity. You don't have to have an art degree, we promise. Not yeah, and no, neither of us do. And we promise this also doesn't involve finger painting <laughs> unless you want it to. I mean, that could be what's best for your employee engagement program, but that's not necessarily what we're recommending. No, could be the cheapest way to decorate your break room. That's true. Um, we're going to answer questions about employee engagement. Um, and if you're watching this in one of the replays, please know there's tons of ways to get a hold of us uh, on whatever page you're watching this on, either our webpage or YouTube, uh, where you can uh, continue to ask questions about employee engagement, even if you are not engaging with this live. And as always, we're going to share our personal anecdotes, um, our witticisms and lessons <laughs> from both our research and our work experience. Okay, so one of the things Dr. Donnelly and I almost start every webinar with uh, is this reminder, because self-awareness is a large part of our um, platform of work and things that we talk about here at Abbey Research. So it's one of the most important qualities for any leader to have um, is to be self-aware. And what that means is um, you know enough about yourself, you know you, how you got to your worldview, you know how you developed your leadership philosophy, your business philosophy, your managing people philosophy, um, because you really have to know yourself before you can even start working on knowing your people. So that is our important reminder that we start pretty much every webinar with. And we really feel that, you know, any cultural issue that you might be having in your office, um, we don't think it's your only problem. So if you've come to this webinar because you think engagement is your number one problem, you might be right in that it's the most immediate problem that you're facing, but we certainly don't think it's the only problem that you're facing in your culture. Um, and we believe in doing enough of a cultural analysis to address the root cause for every problem. So engagement might be the problem that's most on the surface, um, but you might be suffering from a whole host of other problems as well. Uh, you might be suffering from um, turnover and retention, as we talked about at the beginning of the webinar. You might have problems with customer and client satisfaction. Certainly, if you have disengaged employees, they might not be um, performing their best service for your customers or your clients. Disemplo uh, disengaged employees can have uh, poor physical and mental health. They're not gonna be productive, or, and you might not be as profitable. And you might also have other problems as well that could be contributing to disengagement, um, <laughs> toxic cultural issues, uh, as we use uh, in the common parlance these days in the business world. So these could be issues from harassment, bias, discrimination, uh, to interpersonal, inter-office conflicts as well. So you, good news, you could be having a lot of other problems, but we're here to help you um, look immediately at your employee engagement ones. So let's get into this idea of using curiosity in employee engagement. And what we wanted to start first with was what does this idea of engagement mean? So bring a little stats in. We're researchers and we like to do our research. So according to a recent Gallup poll, 70% of employees, U.S. employees, are disengaged at work. And that's a really horrible statistic. That means on average, around 30% of your staff on a day-to-day -day basis feel engaged. But what does that word mean? We talk about employee engagement all the time. We're talking about it in this webinar. But what does it mean to be engaged at work? We want to spend a few minutes breaking that down. Um, so Gallup defines it, uh, according to their research into engagement, as engaged employees are those that are involved in, enthusiastic about, and committed to their work and workplace. Sounds wonderful. That sounds delightful. Um, it's very difficult, and we know this, to get employees that are, at any given point, involved and committed and enthusiastic about their work all the time. Like, all three of those things, involved, committed, and enthusiastic about their work all the time, that's like the dream world. That's perfection. And we know that's not really always achievable or maintainable, but we're gonna talk about some ways that you can analyze that and maybe uh, 
reach some level of parity with that in your organization. Uh, so we really feel like, you know, though it might be impossible to reach and maintain that level of engagement all the time because cultures are constantly changing. You have people coming in and out of your office, even if they aren't engaged or they are engaged. So these constant changes to your culture are going to mean that that level of engagement is always going to fluctuate. But there are questions you can ask of yourself uh, to help you uh, work on trying to maintain that at least. So if you reach that level of engagement, great job. We'd love to talk to you and find out how you did it. Um, but it's important to ask these kind of reflexive questions to realize, you know, how did you get there? So ask yourself, right, we're in this wonderful place. How, what did I do to get us there? How do we adapt to change? How are we adapting to change? Really important questions to constantly ask yourself. And then how do you continue to grow your engagement? So it's, we don't want you to get to this wonderful place of engaged employees and then just stop and think, oh, job's done, work's over, engagement's really good, everybody seems happy, I don't have to keep working on this. Um, one of the most important things to understand about employee engagement is that it needs to be happening all the time. And you need to work on it all the time because if you don't, that's when you're gonna get disengagement. If you don't stay working with your people, you're gonna find slippage in that engagement level. So, I mean, everything Dr. Hinson just said, you may be nodding along and being like, right, that all sounds delightful. I am so far from there, I don't even know where to start. We, I know my folks are disengaged. I didn't need Gallup to tell me that. I know, <laughs> I, I know that this isn't working. Maybe 70% is, is really high for your office, but you've probably got one at least, who you know is probably working on their resume at lunch, um, or if somebody came to them, they'd be out the door pretty quick. And you may not care. That might be a good idea to get them out the door. But our guess is that a lot of you want to keep those folks. So that's why we're talking to you today. Having solid, constructive employee engagement, or as we like to say, curious employee engagement, means that you've got to start with knowing your people. You've got to know why they're on their way out the door, not just that they are. You've got to know why they're disengaged, not just that they are. And so you talk to, talk to them, listen to them, hear them about their interests, their passions, and their personalities. And you'll notice that I said hear and listen as two different words. I come to you today, and all days actually, as a social worker. <laughs> My first master's degree, uh, and the one that I probably use the, of all of the education I use every day of my life, social work is uh, the one I certainly use the most. Yep. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to be part of this incredible fraternity of people, because one of the things it taught me was how to ask stronger questions. That's a huge part of getting to know your employees. So stronger questions, as it says there on the screen, they're open-ended. They can involve follow-up and they require reflection. Let's break that down. So stronger questions are open-ended. You know what that means, everybody does. They're not yes or no questions. So, you know, there's times where yes or no questions are really important. Did you file the report on time? Yes. Okay, maybe that's all you need to know. But then there are other things that perhaps you already know that the report wasn't filed on time. So instead of saying, did you file the report? You say, can, Let's, let's have a conversation about the challenges as to why the report didn't follow it on time. Can we talk about that? Those, the questions can involve follow-up. The joke among people who love social workers is that all of us ask you all the time, tell me more, or unpack that, or how did that make you feel? It's very true. Top three social work questions. It's very, I, as, as the best friend and business partner of a social worker, I can tell you there are always follow-up questions. Always. And there should be for your folks at work too. These are not, I, I have found in my experience, these are the questions that people are the most scared of asking, but the questions that most people crave to be asked. They seem really big. You know, somebody makes a comment like, well, I had a really bad weekend with my wife. If they made that comment, they probably want to talk about it, even if they don't talk about it in that moment. So you say, would, do you want to tell me more about that? And if they go, no, you can smile and go, okay, anytime my door's open that kind of thing. Those are, those are follow-ups. And the required reflection is the, is the most difficult one to cultivate, not only for yourself as the asker, 
but how you ask the question should require reflection on their part. There are times that this is a statement. I have a great professor who every time I would, I would answer a question, she would just smile and say, well, you know, pay attention to that. That was her kind of concluding thought. And I'll tell you that hearing that over and over and over again throughout two years of classes with her programmed me to pay attention and to reflect on why I thought the way I thought or why I reacted the way I react in a consistent pattern. And to have curious employees, which is a big part of engagement, you don't want to be the only curious one in your organization. Curiosity should be cultivated top to bottom within your organization uh, as a key part of resiliency. Everybody has to be engaging in these reflexive, reflexive answers. I know that's a tour de force whirlwind really quick. I just summarized two years of an education for you in a PowerPoint slide. But don't worry, we've got lots of other resources for you around how to really, really crack this out and open. So how do you ask stronger questions too? Let's talk about some physicalities of it. So the first thing is that eye contact is really, really important. We all are busy. I get it. We are all um, distracted by a million blinking lights all the time. When you're asking someone a question that you need real engagement with, you need to be looking at them. If you have an employee that really struggles with eye contact, we would encourage you to have a conversation with them about it. How do they want to be, how can you signal to them that you're paying attention to them? However, statistically, the majority of employees are comfortable with eye contact physiologically and it should be made to them. It communicates that you are engaged with them in that moment. Your body language should be physically engaged towards them. You should be leaning into the table, perhaps you're sitting across, or physically leaning into the conversation. Elbows on the table. You're not at a fancy state dinner. You know, elbows on the table, eye contact. T everything about your body should be pointed to them. And your phones need to be off. This is shorthand for you shouldn't be looking at your computer screen. If you've got an Apple Watch, this is not the time. If you're having this kind of conversation with one of your employees, I don't care if your Apple Watch starts like stabbing you in the wrist, you don't look at it. Um, this, is, this is something you really need to, to engage in. Quick everyday conversations in the hallway are not what we're talking about here. We're talking about some of the really deep diving questions. The other thing you can do is with the permission of the person, if you're having a, a, a conversation that requires this kind of attention, ask them if it's okay to take notes. We take notes in disciplinary conversations all the time, or you should be. If you're not, let's have that conversation. Uh, but we tend to not take notes about things we consider inconsequential. If you have a terrible memory, um, and a lot of people do, it's not the craziest idea to have a scratch piece of paper with your employees and then all of their spouses' names and their kids' names and maybe a couple things their kids are into. Maybe if they're explaining a really complicated situation, ask if it's okay to scribble a couple things that you'll keep private, but you want to be able to remember what's going on and come back to it. If they're explaining to you a really complicated work problem, taking notes is important. Taking notes is not a sign of weakness. It actually communicates to most people that you really, really care. The same way, how do you feel about a waitress who doesn't write your order down? Do you get a little bit nervous it's gonna be wrong? The same way employees feel when their employer um, perhaps isn't taking notes on a complicated situation. So consider that. And our final thing is that lots and lots and lots of people think they're good listeners, and they might be, but very few people are actually good at hearing. People don't necessarily wanna be listened to, they really want to be heard. And the difference between listening and hearing is understanding and kind of proving that understanding with some follow-up statements. If you're ever in a really, um, a really kind of intense conversation with me in particular, at some point you'll hear me say, okay, so what I'm hearing from you is this, 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 and this. Do, is, that what you're, is that what you are trying to tell me? Because that's what I heard. And what that does in that situation is make sure that I am, as I'm listening to you, that I'm actually hearing you. Some of, the, some of that communication failure could be on me. Maybe I wasn't listening properly or wasn't paying attention, but most of the time it's on the person communicating because by the way, we're all terrible communicators unless we're really intentional about it. We speak things that make sense to ourselves in our head and we don't double check that the person is actually understanding what we're saying. So remember that as you talk to your folks too. People want to be heard. They want to be understood. You know, one of the common parlances now is, oh, I feel seen. That means heard, and your people want to be seen. 
So now that we've broken down those two like simple um, and very important steps that you can take uh, towards knowing your people a little bit better, we want to close out by spending a few minutes talking about a creative approach um, to, to uh, thinking creatively about building a curious uh, employee engagement program. And we really feel uh, in the work we do at Abbey Research that there's a, a real strong connection between thinking creatively, creative thinking, and being curious. You have to be curious to think creatively. You need to work on your creativity to practice that curiosity. So what does that mean? We're going to use those C words a lot. Um, so we want to go through our top tips to taking the creative approach. As we said before, this doesn't mean finger painting. This means knowing or learning about your people. And Dr. Donnelly um, just spent a good few minutes talking about ways that you can do that better. Um, asking stronger questions, making sure you're listening actively, taking notes if you need to. I have a terrible memory for people's names, but I will remember people's faces until the day I die. So if I write down people's names after I meet them um, and practice them so that the next time I see them, I know who I'm talking to and I'm able to recall that information because that's important for people feeling like they are being heard and being seen as well is even just remembering uh, bits that you've told them about their lives. Um, so thinking creatively means being willing to experiment. There, you know, there is no cookie cutter answer to employee engagement. Every culture is different. Every program should be different based on the specific alchemy of people that you have in your organization. So. Uh, experiment with ideas on how to um, be creative in your uh, employee engagement. It might mean you try out a couple things uh, and they do or they don't work, um, but you have to have that willingness to give it a try. Be willing to ask for input. So that's really, really important. Um, I think, you know, we can all identify with employee engagement programs that haven't been consultative that haven't asked for people's feedback and those are the ones that aren't going to work because just be if you feel that it might be a good way to engage with your employees they might not agree with you so you have to ask for their input uh, and their feedback on what is and isn't working especially while you're doing this experimenting and then all of that comes with the willingness to make mistakes because you're gonna ask for input, you're gonna experiment, and things aren't gonna work. So it's important to be able to communicate that to your staff so that they know that you're just trying to figure out the best fit for that program, uh, the best fit to keep them uh, engaged and enthusiastic uh, and invested at work, all of those things we talked about, what it means to be engaged. Uh, it's really important that you are authentic about it and that you're able to say like, you know what, we all recognize that that like group board game activity was a disaster. So I've learned from that mistake. I'm moving on from it. Mea culpa. Let's figure out a different way to engage. And along those lines, you know, following up from the mistakes that you're inevitably going to make is the willingness to change. So to look at things, to recognize that it's not working the way that you want it to, to recognize that it's not engaging your people at the level that you want to see. Um, and this kind of, I see this as a cycle, right? So you're willing to change, go back to learning about your people, start this process over. What else could you learn about them? How can you experiment? How can you ask for input to keep changing and ch to keep growing your employee engagement program? I love that point about it being a cycle. And reminder, we talk about that kind of process a lot, that it is a, um, <clears throat> culture is a never ending, never ending thing. Dr. Hinton referred to this several times today that cultures are being built and broken kind of all the time. And so this is not a step-by-step -step linear process. Once you achieve it, you are done and you can move on to another task. This is an ongoing cyclical endeavor in making your culture more curious, ensuring employee engagement is an ongoing entity, which is why a lot of people, we understand outsource it. We get that kind of exhaustion. And there are parts of employee engagement that are definitely great to outsource, things like prizes and, and events and things like that. But some of this base level engagement, we really, really encourage you, this is not something you can outsource. 
because it's very challenging to achieve that high level of engagement. But some of the steps towards getting there are very simple. When you know yourself and you know your people, you, and you do that through asking better questions, both of yourself and of them, practicing active listening and thinking creatively about how you can engage them. Thinking creatively also, like as Dr. Hinson just said, I'll reiterate it, it comes from your folks. You are not meant to be the genius on the mountain who imparts the wisdom to everybody else. Not in this particular arena. This is a collaborative and, and constant endeavor that should absolutely include your people in terms of authenticity and engagement and feedback and everything else. We've worked with a couple clients who tell us that their absolute best employee engagement um, programs have come from the employees themselves and that every single one of the management ideas failed. <laughs> and that's not an uncommon problem, not an uncommon pattern. Not so at all. your folks, learn to listen to them, learn to hear them. And I, we think, actually, we know you'll be amazed at what you get. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for watching the webinar. We hope that it was everything you dreamed and more. Yes. Um, and this one was edited, of yeah. course, but we would love for you to be able to join us live for the next one, which it will have lots more interactive opportunities, time for you to ask questions, and opportunities to win prizes. So how can you find out about our webinars? That's a great question. Great question. If you're watching this replay back on YouTube, there will be a link to sign up for our newsletter in the show notes below. If you are watching this on our website, just scroll down to the bottom of the page, sign up for the newsletter. You'll see a box that says research digest and a little thing. Type your email in there and and away you go. Away you go. We'll uh, see you for Follow the next one. us on all of our social media if you want to as well. We post about uh, our upcoming webinars and all sorts of things uh, of interest there as well. So we hope you've enjoyed this replay and we really look forward to seeing you on our next webinar. Uh, see you later from the good doctors. Bye.